Thank you. Sorry. Uh, right. Yeah. So, hello everyone. Uh, so, my name is Jack Lennox. Um, as John said, I work at Automatic. I have. Uh, I spent my first couple of years at Automatic working on the theme division, so I was mainly focused on themes and on all of the experience around themes and how users select themes, how they get started with websites, that kind of thing. And about six months ago, I transitioned onto the VIP team at Automatic, and uh, it was quite eye-opening for me because, as you'll see, the Automatic uh, WordPress.com VIP team is kind of way down, they're like the canary down the mine for everyone using WordPress because they do some of the craziest stuff you can imagine with WordPress. Um, I do have a habit of speaking quite quickly, so, and I know that like, I have a funny accent and everything, so um, if I am speaking too quickly, just tell me to slow down, this is very much an open thing, and this is obviously quite casual, so if anyone has any questions while I'm talking, you can stop me and, and we, can, we can talk about things, that's absolutely fine. So, <coughs> WordPress.com VIP, I appreciate not everyone here necessarily knows anything about WordPress.com VIP, so firstly, like, why should you care, why should, why should you have any interest anyway? Um, WordPress.com VIP, I'm just going to come over here so I can see my laptop. Um, yeah, so it's enterprise level WordPress hosting on the WordPress.com platform. Uh, we serve about 2.5 billion page views per month. Um, we have 99.9976% uptime, and we have a 349 millisecond average response time, which is pretty, pretty good. So some of you may also not really know about WordPress.com, so there's another question I need to kind of answer here. Um, WordPress.com is the largest single WordPress installation in the world. So it's just basically a massive WordPress multi-site. If anyone's dealt with multi-sites, only unlike most multi-sites, which maybe have 10 or 15 or 20 websites, uh, we've got now getting onto 100 million, uh, all running on WordPress.com. So it's pretty nuts. Um, we're serving through WordPress.com, 21 and a half billion page views per month, and 55.8 uh, million new posts per month. It's pretty insane. Uh, and tens of millions of sites and blogs, as I said, I think the exact figure is getting towards 100 million. We don't tend to talk about it because there's obviously lots of spam blogs and stuff. So <laughs> we'll just say tens of millions because that's more accurate as to how many people actually use it. Back to VIP. Um, this is our this is our from our um, our promotional website for WordPress VIP. And actually, this is getting a bit out of date now because we've now added to this list like uh, Microsoft and uh, Facebook. Um, it's pretty crazy. So loads of the Facebook blogs are on are on WordPress.com VIP, as well as a lot of the microsites they've been launching around their brand and around different values they have, the subdomains that they run. Um, that's on with us. And like the Microsoft uh, Studios website is is WordPress.com as well, and and on VIP. Uh, so it's pretty pretty cool. There's loads of uh, newspaper wise, it's huge, and we're just getting the. Uh, there's a whole load of new News Corp stuff coming over in the UK, and News Corp Australia is all on WordPress.com. It's crazy. Loads and loads and loads and loads of stuff. Um, now, the problems with this system is that VIPs want to build their own stuff. And for anyone who's run a WordPress multi-site, uh, you may know that it's pretty restrictive. Uh, you kind of have to run the same thing for everyone. So if you have hundreds of millions of bloggers on the one hand, and then you have big corporations on the other hand, it gets pretty tricky to try and keep all these things together. WordPress multi-site, as I say. And it's very difficult for us to vet every developer. Uh, so the way that we get around this issue of allowing people to submit their code to WordPress.com VIP is our solutions, which are code review, code review, code review. Ah. Um, we review every single line of code uh, for our VIP clients. And um, so far we've reviewed about 9 million since we got going. So uh, hand reviewed by people. It's pretty crazy. And this was one of the first key learnings I had on the VIP team. I hadn't really done a lot of code review. I'd worked with people a bit. Um, just out of interest, who here has done some code review? Almost no one, that's perfect, brilliant. Uh, that's great, because um, yeah, because you'll, you'll be interested hopefully in, in why it's interesting. Um, so these are the reasons why we do code review. Uh, safe code is, the, is the, one of the primary things. Um, we're allowing, to some extent, people that we know to submit their code to WordPress.com VIP. They're from trusted clients and companies. Um, but you know, anyone can be an intern, anyone can be at any different level. So code coming in can be from absolutely anyone. So we will check it for, for XSS vulnerabilities, uh, unescaped and unsanitized code. And I'm gonna go through what those things are and why they're important. Um, but that's our primary thing, is, is keeping everything safe. And obviously on the WordPress.com infrastructure, it is one massive multi-site. So one bug from one developer couldn't bring down the whole thing, but it's getting towards that way. So it would be absolutely catastrophic if we weren't on it with this kind of thing. The second thing is scalable code. Uh, because we have this massive shared infrastructure, again, we need to make sure that people are building stuff that's going to work, it's going to be scalable, it's not going to knock out 
one of our clusters or one of our data centers because they've got some crazy query that's you know querying by meta keys and values and yeah causing us loads of problems across millions of posts or something like that so um so we want to focus on smart queries uh, make sure that all the functions that are being used are cached and again i'll talk about that and we want to make sure the code is actually good it's dry uh, do not repeat yourself for people who aren't familiar with that term and the final thing is readable code. Um, some of you may know there are a set of WordPress coding standards, which sadly a lot of people don't, don't use. Um, and I'm going to talk about how you can use them if you don't. And uh, yeah, and we want to make sure that the code is readable. Code is read far more than it's written. Uh, so we want to make sure that if there is a problem, it's easy for someone to dig in, find out what the problem is, and hopefully solve it. And if the code's all spaghetti mess, then it's very hard to work out what's going wrong. So, to elaborate a bit on safe code, what do I mean by this? Um, one of the key premises of, of producing safe and secure code is to validate and or sanitize early. And I'm going to go into exactly what I mean by that, but hopefully some of you have some idea what that is. The second thing is to escape late. And the third thing is to be aware of the type juggler, which is a PHP itself. And again, I'll explain, you may be wondering what the hell that is, I'll explain what that is in a second. The guiding principles of our code review process are to never trust user input, uh, escape as late as possible, escape everything from untrusted sources like databases, your database is untrusted, and users, third parties like Twitter, anything else that's coming in, basically everything. Never assume anything, never trust user input. Sanitization is okay, but validation or rejection is better, and I'll explain the differences in a second. Never trust user input. Maybe you got the message. Uh, I have links at the bottom, by the way, so I will share my slides and you can find more information on this from the links that I'm putting at the bottom of each slide. Uh, so validation and sanitization. Uh, who here knows what I mean by validation and sanitization? Good. This is a good talk. Right. Well, hopefully, yeah, as long as I can explain it properly. Right. So validation is to check if the data that you have is what you actually want. Um, for example, we have a function within WordPress. This is a core function anyone can use called is email. And you can look it up in core. Is email basically runs a series of checks to see if an email does at least look like an email. It doesn't check if it actually exists. It doesn't send the, an email to that email address. It will just say, is this some characters, followed by an at sign, followed by some more characters, followed by a dot, followed by some more characters, and then maybe some more dots, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and validation is great, because if you're, if you're validating your data correctly, then you know before you even try to sanitize it and check that it hasn't got any dodgy things in it, you know that it is at least looking like the thing that you want. And you can reject it at this point potentially. So if you're building an application or you're building something in WordPress or a comment system or anything like that, um, you can say to the user, if the thing isn't even an email address, look, it's not an email address. And there's loads of other examples, like if it was in Singapore, you might be checking for, say, a postcode, and you know that a postcode is six digits, isn't it, I think? Yeah. So you can say, is this string six digits? If it's not, reject it. It's not, it's not, it's not the right thing. Uh, there are a whole bunch of, um, of functions that WordPress provides, and that you find those at the link. One of the most popularly used ones is, is email, which is very handy. So this is just this just returns a Boolean value. So if the thing you pass in between the brackets is an email, it will return true. If the thing is not an email, it will return false. Sanitization is kind of the next step after validation because something might be sane. It might it might be something that is what it says it is, but it could still be dodgy. It could still be an email address that's actually full of apostrophes and maybe has a SQL injection or something else which is going to ruin your site. Um, so sanitization basically is then to take the data that you've been given and to run it through some checks and potentially replace things in it that you don't want. So for example, an email address would never have a space in it. Um, I think actually his email would pick that up, but let's say you might, have a, you might want to run a function that says like, if there's any spaces in this string, take it out because then it's not an email. Um, so there are a whole class of functions in WordPress core. And again, you find those at the link at the bottom. I couldn't, there's so many, I didn't want to list them all out here, but they, I've given them the sanitize asterisk, etc. So for example, there are things like sanitize text field, which will run all of the relevant checks for sanitizing a text field. Uh, there's a whole load of others around, I'm trying to think now, there's like sanitize user, I think the sanitize URL. Um, also user, sanitize user is username. So it will run all of the checks that meet the WordPress criteria for what a username is. Sanitize URL will run all the checks for what a URL should be, uh, and it will, it will get rid of anything that shouldn't be there. Um, and one of the most common things is if, say, there's some HTML in there, it will turn it into, it will take the HTML entities and turn them into plain text. So you've probably seen things like uh, and uh, AMP 
colon, and that's like that's that that is that's an ampersand, obviously. Uh, but when you sanitize it, you don't want to put an ampersand in because an ampersand could be interpreted as something dodgy, as part of a bigger query or something. So you turn it into and etc. And it works. It's nice. Um, again, never trust user input. At the other end, this is how we check things that are coming in. So hopefully if we're validating and we're sanitizing, then by the time anything goes into the database, we know that it's good. Um, I'll have a quick drink. We know that it's at least not too dodgy, hopefully. And we know that it's hopefully going to be safe. But we still don't trust it. As I said, never trust user input. So at the other end, when you are presenting content to the user, we do something known as escaping. Now, escaping looks kind of like this. These are some of the helper functions that WordPress provides. Again, there are actually more than this, but these are some of the key ones that we use a heck of a lot. So one of the, one of the, the, the top one is escape HTML. So what that's going to do is escape. It's going to check for content that you've taken from your database or you've taken from Twitter or somewhere else, and it's going to check that it is HTML. So it's going to get rid of anything that doesn't fit what it considers to be valid HTML. Um, and then like at the other end of that, you have something like escape text area. And what that's going to do is actually get rid of all the HTML as well, and it's going to turn it into entities, which means that if you use escape text area on some HTML, what the user would ultimately see is the actual HTML in the browser, because it's, it, would, it would appear to the user like code, whereas it shouldn't happen because the browser should interpret it, but it won't if you turn it into entities. Uh, well, if you strip the entities and turn them into um, plain text. Then you've got things like escape URL. That will just basically make sure something is a URL. It's kind of all the same things as sanitizing. It's just doing it on the other end. So that even if someone did manage to get something dodgy into your site, you know you're saving it, and you know it's still not going to cause any problems, hopefully. And then things like escape ATTR, that's escape attribute. So say you're building up an HTML element, and you've got like the ID and the class and those kinds of things. You use escape attribute to check that it's what an attribute should be. An attribute, for example, should not have uh, quotation marks in it, because that could end the attribute and do something else. And you could do an XSS uh, or something like that, which would be pretty nasty. We then have things like escape JS, escape JS at the end. Uh, that's if you've got some inline JS in your, in your um, HTML page. So if you're using, say, a script tag and you've got some JavaScript, you use escape JS, and it will make sure that all that's in there is valid JavaScript and nothing dodgy. The good news is, for people who are kind of earlier on in their process of being a developer, most WordPress functions are going to handle this for you. So things like the underscore title, the underscore content, those things are going to automatically escape anything that you're, that you're using. So you don't have to worry about it. So don't start having to wrap like everything you do around with these escaping functions. They're only for custom content. Uh, anything that's coming from the core stuff is fine. Don't need to worry about it. It's all good. And yeah, I said about escaping late, and why is that? Um, the reason that sanitizing early is important is because the minute you're getting user data, you might start doing something with it. So you want to sanitize it as early as possible so that there's no chance of anything leaking into any other part of your code and your program. Uh, that's obviously going to be bad news. At the other end, it's good to escape late because hopefully the data is already sanitized. All you're already doing is checking as a final check that it is what it says it is. Um, one of the reasons we do it late is that it's safe because um, yeah, because you, if you escape it earlier, it might actually cause you some problems because escaping it might break certain other things that where you need the, the raw code. Because, for example, if you're doing escape text area, it's going to strip stuff out that you don't necessarily want stripped out. And it's easier to read because if you're escaping late, you can see if something has been escaped. So you'd normally escape at the very last minute. So say when you use echo in PHP, you're going to go echo, escape, attribute, and then the attribute. And that way you can see if something's escaped. If you've escaped it earlier, and then you're echoing the variable that's already escaped, you don't actually, you have to then like, someone else or you has to go back and work out where you did escape something. So it's best to escape late. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, it's best to escape late um, so that you can actually just see that that is what you've done and that's what you intended to do. Type juggling. Does anyone know what type juggling is? Literally no one. Oh, cool, right. So. Have you ever done something like this? Has anyone seen something like this? So WordPress has the standard, sorry, not WordPress, PHP, has uh, standard comparison operators. They are things like equals equals and exclamation mark equals, which means doesn't equal. Um, this is how a lot of people will start out using PHP. But the problem here is that equals equals 
doesn't actually check that two things are exactly the same. It kind of works out types uh, automatically. So when you do something like zero equals equals a string called anything, uh, PHP actually thinks they are they are the same because they're not because zero is not false um, and anything is true as a boolean. So it will basically it will juggle those two types and give you true equals equals true, uh, which is pretty bad news if this isn't what you wanted. Um, if you did if it is what you wanted, then that's fine. Uh, there's a load more very scary things. Uh, if you go to this link, which again you'll see on my slides. Uh, PHP website has demonstrations of all these different things that can equal the same thing when they really don't equal the same thing. There's a very easy way around this and it's strict comparison operators. So equals 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 checks the two things are exactly the same. So in this situation a string with anything is the only thing that is exactly the same as a string with anything. So that would come back as false, which is much better. This is kind of a bit of a weird example because you'd almost never actually do this, but oh, actually maybe you would. Yeah, there are, there are plenty of checks that you probably have throughout your code where you're looking for things that are equal to each other. And obviously this could be very insecure if you're checking that a password it, that someone has entered is the right password that the user has on the, uh, that you have on your database. Using equals equals, it might, they could put zero in and they'd, they'd be able to hack into your website. Uh, it's pretty bad news. Again, if you are building a login system, really do understand these things because <laughs> that would be bad. Um, so yeah, strict comparison operators. The equivalent is is don't equals uh, exclamation mark equals equals, which is something doesn't equal. And there are some more. Um, so you can see here we have equals 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 exclamation mark equals equals hash underscore equals. I'll explain that one in a second. And in array. So in array is a function people use quite a lot. You're checking that one thing is in an array. So you've got this needle haystack thing. If you don't put true as the third argument for the in array function, it's not strict. So it will do the same thing as above. So if you say in array zero, and pretty much any array, it will say that that zero is in that array, even though it isn't, um, because it's looking for true, which is terrible. Anyway, so you put true at the end, like I've done here, and then it will be strict. Hash equals. So a question on your uh, yeah yeah. The best practice then is it best to just do three equals most of the time. Would you ever do two equals and that would be the better practice? I can't think of a reason why I would ever do that, no. And, and so on WordPress.com VIP, we, we don't allow it. So it was, we, we, are, we insist that you use strict comparison operators. Um, yeah, I mean, we do, we do, I think we say in our documentation, unless you have a good reason. I can't think of a good reason. <laughs> but uh, I, suppose, I suppose it's okay if you are just checking Booleans, maybe. Because like Booleans are... Strictly Booleans. Then. Yeah. <laughs> like false won't equal equal true. So you, you're okay there. <laughs> But, uh, but generally speaking, I would always use strict comparison operators. Um, so then we get into something really crazy, and I'll just take a slight detour on this, but hash equals is a new function that was introduced to WordPress, uh, sorry, PHP 5.6. So by, by virtue, it's obviously part of WordPress as well. Um, and hash equals is, a, is an even stricter form of the strict comparison operators. It's effectively exactly the same, but what people may not know is that equals 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 the way that will check if two things are the same say say it's two strings and say it's a password and one string is password and one string is pass work or something what equals 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 will do i hate saying this equals 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 it will check that p and p are the same yep and then it will say a and a are the same yep s is the same yep s is the same yep w is the same until it gets to d and then it will say oh d is not f so return false and that's how I think it works the same in Ruby and a lot of other languages. Um, and the problem there, and this is pretty outside, but if someone was trying to brute force your website, uh, they can actually, it's kind of like cracking a safe. Because if they're brute forcing passwords, they can tell by how long it's taken for your server to respond, if they've made any progress or not on cracking a password. They can tell if they've got the first character right or not. Now, don't worry too much, because this is pretty crazy, and I think for the most small websites, there's, it's very unlikely you're gonna have this, but it, it has happened at like at the enterprise level, uh, and it is worth worrying about, because yeah, that like although there's latency and everything on the network, it is possible for them to measure if they are cracking a password or not. Hash underscore equals will always take the same amount of time, so it will finish doing the complete comparison before it returns, so there's no way anyone who's as clever as they wanna be can work out if they are cracking a password or not. So that's like, that's the craziest form of a, a strict comparison operator. But it's worth knowing about. It was quite exciting when it was introduced in PHP 5.6. Um, and obviously on the web, 
it's pretty hard. Like you're gonna have to, to brute force something. It's gonna take absolutely ages, and you're you're probably gonna pick up on someone constantly trying lots of different passwords. Hopefully, you have some sort of reporting that's like this guy entered his password about 800 million times. So there's probably a problem going on here. But it does get if you ever build anything in PHP that might be used offline, like if they're able to run WordPress on their own system with your data or something like that, but they can't log in, then they could if they if they could just hammer it uh, until they've until they've got through it. So it's worth considering if anyone's building a crazy complex online banking system or something. But hopefully no one is, so it's all fine. But, uh... So I talked about scalable code as well. What do I mean by that? Um, WordPress has a load of uncached functions. Um, and right at the start, actually, because I haven't got a link on here, but when I put my slides up, we have a really great resource, which is uh, what, what the VI team looks for when we do code review. So again, this isn't a full list. This is some of the more common ones. Um, but you can get the full list on, on our, on our um, documentation page. But get post is one of the most, like, one of the ones that beginners often use and they don't realize. The problem with get post is it will always do uh, a MySQL query, uh, whereas WP query won't. Like, WP query will actually cache what it finds and store it for the next time. So it's kind of a heck of a lot safer than using get posts. And get posts can have some really nasty queries in it, which can become very problematic. All of these things are totally fine when you have like five posts. Like you can do a lot of the kind of scalability stuff that we talk about on the VIP team. It's just like not even remotely a problem if you only have a handful of posts. Uh, but I learned the hard way, like I had a, not really a startup, but I built a site for writers uh, that was a bit like Flickr, but for people to share their creative writing. And it was powered by WordPress and it was for sharing like poetry and that kind of thing. And um, and I, it was all working really well. It was it was quite nice. Everything was going sw swimmingly. And uh, Stephen Fry tweeted about it. He's like very famous in the UK. Has a, well, he's now left Twitter, but he had a lot of followers. And uh, and they, I, my database just started falling over constantly. And the thing was, no matter how much I scaled up the resources behind the database, it just kept falling over. Um, and it wasn't until a friend of mine who knows a little bit about running systems. This was some time ago, so I was young and dangerous. And uh, and he was running. Um, Oh, there's a query you can run which checks for slow queries on Linux, so you can run it like on the server. And he did it's like MySQL slow or something, and it will bring up. And I had a query that was taking about 48 seconds every single time someone hit the site. And obviously, what it was actually doing was just crashing. Um, and it was just a crap query that I was able to rewrite to do exactly the same thing. And suddenly, everything was running really smoothly again. And in fact, I also cached the responses from it, which I'll talk about. So um, yeah, so. If, any, if your site gets big and people start putting loads of stuff on it, then you really need to worry about these things because it does get out of hand really fast. Uh, and you only need a few thousand posts. So you, you might be running something that's not massive, but like if you're, if you're signing off on a project for a client and they go away and it's a magazine or something and they're adding loads and loads of stuff, like they could get to a few hundred posts and problems could really start to occur for them. Uh, and the, the scary part of all this is it can be really expensive because you might be thinking, oh, we need to up the server resources. So you might be putting loads and loads and loads of more resources into your server when actually you're just in a complete losing game. Like you're just going to be paying out like way more than you need to when you could just use something else. So pretty much you never need to use get posts. Um, you don't really need to use any of these other ones either. Uh, what we normally recommend is that you use, um, there's a function called WP pluck list. So there's ways of getting all the categories from from the, uh, yeah, getting all the categories uh, from your database and then just plucking the ones that you actually want. I think it's a pluck list terms. It's on this site. Yep. Can some of these um, direct queries to the database uh, can they be solved more contextually, like using like mempatch? Yes. Like, yeah. Even if, <coughs> even if the code is, if you do use get posts, your architecture will know that it's going to go to the database, but before it, and then it's going to sit studying mempatch. Yes. So you, the next call will go to memcache and will not go to memcache. Exactly. And there's a whole load of functions like WP cache set, WP cache get. So if you are using something like this, you should just do it like once an hour or something. Or even once every five minutes is better than like just having it every time. And then you can just cache the response from it and serve the response from, sorry, serve the cached data instead of the actual thing. The other good news is for all of these, the VIP team have written helper functions. So we've basically written a plugin which you can use which turns all of these, so like WP get recent posts becomes WP VIP get recent posts, and it's a cached version of these uncached functions. 
So again, I will share all the resources, but this is kind of really cool stuff that the VIP team do, does that I was working at the same company and didn't even realize. And because we open source like loads of the work we do. So if you want like the best practice thing here, you can just get it straight from us and you can use it. And then you can have all the VIP stuff in your, in your site. And yeah, and not even have to worry about doing that. But uh, that, that was kind of my next thing. So yeah, you don't have to worry about trying to work out different ways of doing it necessarily. Um, and kind of linked to this, we have really gnarly queries. There are things within WordPress that are just known to be really, really bad. And for reasons of backwards compatibility and other things, they can't be taken out. So the worst ones are category not in, which is put, you can use as part of like a get post query, tag not in, tax query, no limit queries, because obviously initially if you've got 10 posts and you're saying get pages per post, like minus one, uh, post per page, whatever it is, yeah. You set that in like in your query, you can say minus one, which will get an infinite number, which is fine when you've got like 10 posts or even 100 posts. But even getting beyond a few hundred posts, like things start to get pretty pretty messy um, and can start to break stuff. And then order by rand is like one of the worst things in MySQL because uh, it basically has to get everything. So it does, a, it does a no limit query and then randomizes. So say you want five posts and you want them to be random. Uh, what it's going to do is get your whole all the posts in your data in, in your table and then it's going to randomize them and take the top five so it's so mad never ever use order by rand uh, if you do want to do something like that the easiest way to do it is to get a certain number of posts and randomize them yourself and then pluck them off the top like that so so you're gonna and, and you could even like you could do it by a category or something if you wanted it to go back a long way but yeah order by rand absolutely terrible never do that Another thing that's a bit more hidden, and people don't necessarily think about this, but doing like an Ajax call on every single page load. So by that, I mean if you've got some JavaScript that's going to run off and get something every single time someone hits your website, it's okay at a small scale, but if you start getting even a few hundred people a minute that are coming to your website, then you're running all these extra queries, and if that's something on your site, if it's going to like a REST API or something, it can be really, really bad. It's, uh, so again, you want to be trying to cache stuff that's coming back. So the two functions, I don't actually have if I have a slide for them, but it's WP cache set, WP cache get. And if you just look up, if you just Google like WordPress caching, you'll get the codex page, which explains all of these things better than I can do it. Um, so yeah, these are, these are key things that we look for that we try to avoid. And again, I wanna, I wanna like restate here that these are things that I didn't necessarily know that much about coming onto the VIP team. And I've been working with WordPress for years. And uh, this, some of these things were quite scary. Um, and the best, the link I'll put up at the end, which is just excellent, is the what we look for page on the VIP team's uh, documentation. It's just this amazing list of all the slightly weird things about WordPress that you want to be wary of. And uh, about half of it I was not familiar with. I, it was, it was mind-blowing. Um, and it's all public. It's all just on vip.wordpress.com slash documentation. So yeah, it's really, really handy. It's just free. Use it. It's great. Um, I'm going to finish up by talking about some of the tools that, that I also discovered through working on the VIP team. Um, and I wanted to demonstrate how to set some of them up. But one of them is actually quite, it's not that difficult to set it up, but it's too hard to explain it in a talk. So I'm going to write a blog post about it and share it. Um, but I haven't done it yet. But I'm going to show you it because it's really, really cool. Uh, has anyone heard of Xdebug? Has anyone used Xdebug? John? Robert? Cool. Okay, right. So um, actually, I'll go through the three of them, then I'll show you the, my little demos. So Xdebug is the first one. It basically allows you to live debug what's happening on your WordPress website. And it's, it's pretty crazy. It's, uh, it's, it's very, very useful, very handy. And when the first time I used this, it, it, it blew my mind. Um, PHP Code Sniffer. Is anyone, anyone using this? John? Very good, John. <laughs> Scoring top marks. Um, PHP Code Sniffer is just basically like a spell check for your PHP. It really, like, everyone should use this. And so many people who commit code to WordPress.com VIP don't use it. And it drives me mad, because I can tell when someone's not using it. Um, and you can, you can plug it into the WordPress coding standards. So just like a spell check when you're typing, it will just point out stuff you're doing that doesn't meet the WordPress coding standards. And the best thing about the WordPress coding standards is they have, there's like five different bits. There's like the core coding standards, there's then the VIP coding standards, a couple of other community ones, I think maybe one for BuddyPress or something. Um, and so the VIP coding standards are also in there by default. So for example, if you're echoing a variable that you haven't escaped, the whole latest escaping thing I was talking about, it will tell you and it will say you should probably be escaping this. And if you're using a variable that you haven't sanitized, it will tell you. 
and it's so great because just like while you're typing it's just pointing out problems and it's just and it's so quick and easy and it tells you exactly what the problem is it doesn't just like highlight it it actually says the problem uh, and then you can look it up and work out how to fix it the other tool which i'm guessing more people might have used is beyond compare uh, I'd heard of this years ago, but it's just like changed my life since I've been doing VIP stuff. It's just a really, really handy tool for comparing anything. So you can take like two directories and it'll tell you if anything's changed. So it's particularly useful if you're, for example, if you want to check a new plugin versus the old version and a new version's been released, you can just use Beyond Compare and it will show you all the little things that have changed. It's really handy. There are things in code editors to do this, but I've never seen anything quite as quick and easy as Beyond Compare's tools for doing Diffs is, is all it is really, but it's just really nice. And you just pick like any file on your computer, any other file, and it will show you how they're different. It's really handy. So, Xdebug. Let's see what happens. This is a, it's a pretty like unwieldy tool. So, um, so hopefully, I'm, I did test it before I came up. Let's hope this works. So, we have a VIP test site. Which, uh, so this is a site that has all the same things as all the other VIP sites, but it runs like 2011, and we just test it for random things. So someone's put like bacon as the strap line and stuff, you know, it's just uh, just anything. But, and I'll also bring over my text editor. And before I do that. Right. Oh, I've done it in the wrong window. It's very unhelpful. Uh, unfortunately, I think there's a keyboard shortcut for doing this in this particular. I use Vim, which some people, some of you may hate because it's uh, it's a bit a bit codey. Uh, I'll make it a bit bigger actually. So yeah, configuring Xdebug is not actually that difficult, but none of the demos I could find explained it very well. We have some internal documentation for how we use it, um, so that's how I got it set up. Uh, so it works very well with WordPress.com for developers at WordPress.com. But um, but yeah, I know it, it can be used for do it working on core, and I just want to show you very briefly one of the cool things it can do. So I'm probably going to need to actually switch around and get like this. Right. So this is our test site. This is a file uh, that is used at some point in this test site. I might actually yeah, it's okay that big, isn't it? Um, now what we can do, if we come down to a bit of code, let's say that we are having a problem with a variable and we want to know what that variable is. So you can see here, I've got this little check that goes on that says, is Calypso compatible VIP? And then we do this check and we say like, does VIP Calypso, comp uh, Cal Calypso compatible equals 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 gray list flag blog ID. It's a bit awkward with the line break. I should come down slightly inside. Yeah, I will do actually just slightly do that because it looks even harder to read than it should be. I appreciate this may seem like really complex stuff. You don't really need to say anything about the code. It's not, it's just lots of it. Um, but what I've done here, so in my text editor, and it works in loads of other text editors, um, PHP Storm is the one that's the most easy to get set up. I'm doing it with Vim. You can also do it with like Sublime Text and anything else that you use. Um, I think actually classically, Xdebug is designed for using with Eclipse, which is like the really old Java editor. So um, you may have used it, with, it, and it works with other languages, it's not just PHP. But, um, so I've got everything set up for this to work, hopefully. So I can set breakpoints. So I set a breakpoint there, which you can see by the green thing in, the, in the, uh, my margin. So I've now turned the breakpoint off, I've turned the breakpoint on. So now what I can do, let's just double check this is set up to work, I think it is. Right, if I press, so for me, I press F5, which makes it start listening. And again, like if you're using PHP Storm, it's a nice interface where you press like record. It's more of a kind of human understandable thing. Whereas Vim, which is designed for idiots, is uh, you press like just random keys. So F5, and now it starts listening. If I now refresh this page, as this page starts to refresh, Vim has now completely changed. So we're now in like this Xdebug view. 
So it's now stopped. What Vim will do, uh, sorry, what Xdebug will do by default is it will stop at the first line it hits in your, in your code. So the first line it's going to hit in any WordPress website is index.php define WPU's themes true. So that obviously that's just a standard breakpoint. Nothing's happened. There's no variables or anything. If I hit a five, it's going to run to my breakpoint. So my first breakpoint, which is the one that you saw me set. So here we go. We can now see this first breakpoint in the code. Meanwhile, the page is just still loading. So you can see it's actually loading up in the top left-hand corner. It's just hanging, waiting for me to do stuff. It's the same as when you try and debug JavaScript using like Chrome. You can do that within the browser, but it's doing it within my PHP. So at the moment, because I've stopped it before this variable gets defined, it's just uninitialized. Like the variable exists, but there's nothing in it. If I press F5, uh, F2, sorry, it will go to the next line of code. And in doing that, there we go. Is Calypso compatible VIP? Is set? There's a Boolean. It's false. And if we carry on, I can just press F2 and run line by line through this code. So each bit of code it executes, it will just take me to it, and then I can see what else is happening over on the left hand, over on the right hand side. So we still don't yet have a blog ID. If we carry on, it will just like continue to set these things up. So now we actually have, for example, this instance variable, and we can now see what that is. And if I go across to that window, on my screen normally it's a bit easier to read this because we don't have a. I'm not having to deal with this massive font, <laughs> but if we go over, oh, whoa, here we go. Oh, it's actually, it's, it's wrapping. So you can see, yeah, so it's post type is a post. We see the edit capability of this instance thing. I don't even know what this is, but it's just interesting. I can now actually see this like variable being put together. Um, it's pretty, pretty amazing. Um, and when you are dealing with a much simpler problem, so say you just have um, a variable that's kind of, that's not being set to what you expect it to be set to, you can sit here and work out exactly what line it gets set to the wrong thing. Uh, it's really, really amazing. Showing it to you in Vim is probably not a good idea because it just like, looks overwhelming and crazy. But um, yeah, PHP Storm has a really nice interface for dealing with it. Um, I like this, but yeah, not everyone does. So that's Xdebug, and if I press F6, it's gonna, we're gonna finish debugging. And so it's now not connected anymore. If I press F6 again, it just takes me back to where I was, and I can take the breakpoint off, and I can maybe edit some stuff here. And what will normally happen is, because if you take more than, I think, 60 seconds, then what PHP is going to time out. So you can actually carry I could have carried on debugging it, but normally it's taken too long to load. So as far as WordPress.com is concerned, this website's broken. But I just refresh, and it just comes back as it normally would. So this is like remote debugging. I'm debugging something live over the internet. It's, it's pretty crazy. And, and the way it actually knows where the code is, is that I've got a replica of the entire WordPress.com code base on my laptop, and I've mapped them. So it knows that, like... Wherever WordPress.com is doing this, on my laptop, it should find it here. And that's how it's telling me which lines it's getting to. It's like not, it's, it's just brilliant. But you could use it if you ever want to get involved in working on WordPress core. It's really great for that. Um, it is a bit of a power tool, so don't worry. Like if, if you're just like, this just looks crazy, I don't, I don't, I don't care. That's fine. Um, I understand. <laughs> but uh, I just thought I'd show you anyway. So, um, let's so move back. This is actually like light. Yeah, production it's exactly what it is. Yeah, so you can be you you can live debug something on the internet, and it's 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 not massively complicated to set it up, but it just requires a bit more than I can explain in a talk. But but yeah, it's it's that, and setting it up locally is actually easier as well. If you just want to debug like something in MAMP or uh, if you're using like VVV or something, it's it's. Right, I guess you're you're leaving something out from the picture right? because I was like, I'm leaving the setup out. You're leaving something out. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, I'm just wondering how that's the setup. Yeah. The setup. Yeah. So, but the, the, I can tell you the basics about it actually. So all that all that really happens is that um, the most the most pivotal thing here is that I connect to uh, my WordPress sandbox, my WordPress.com sandbox on port nine thousand. So my computer is using port nine thousand to connect to that website simultaneously as I'm looking at it through the browser. So they then kind of Xdebug controls the whole thing talking. So it knows via that port what's happening. Yeah. So it's like. He's refreshed, and then they're like, right. Your browser is port 80. Yeah, your browser is normally port 80. So you're, you're doing like a synchronous thing with two so ports. You gotta install PHP Xdebug in the first place. Yeah, you actually install Xdebug yourself. Oh, so it's, it's not a third party service. Yeah. It's a module within the server's PHP. Itself. Yes. So you install it on your server, which is not too complicated, but a bit too hard to say. Yeah. So you install it on your server. You connect on you connect on port nine port nine thousand is the default for Xdebug. You can change it to whatever you like, nine thousand one, whatever. Uh, but yeah, and if you have like it can get really complicated. It uses an IDE key as well. You can set that to nothing, and then it will just listen on everything. But if you were debugging loads of different sites simultaneously, you can theoretically have loads of different IDE keys and have like loads of different things going on. It just gets like way over. I mean, it's like when I'm using uh, Xdebug, I often feel like I'm at the very limit of. <laughs> 
my ability because it's just like wow this is this is pretty crazy but i have found it really handy in debugging certain problems where just like normally what people would do is use an error log or something and then you just start error logging and then you'd run through the error log and see if that's what, like and it just takes ages whereas with this you can just like live pop, 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 pop. where does the variable go funny there that's the problem um yeah it's cool so uh i think i lost where i was on the slides but the next one is code sniffer i won't even bother yeah so code sniffer demo so this should be a bit easier to do so i actually like removed this while i was um doing the last demo but if i now do a little command again like if you're using something like uh like vim uh, sorry like sublime text this is why is it not coming back it's it's more like human friendly and i'll close this and open it again actually i'll just show you this file this is fine uh yeah this works I realise this just looks nuts, uh, but what is happening here is the bottom half of my screen is showing me the current errors. So um, let's just like create some space here and get rid of all of this so it just looks a bit easier to understand. So let's say I want to try something. Let's say I'm going to uh, echo dangerous variable. And let's say I save that. So, um, the PHP code sniffer has picked up a problem. It does this weird little S thing, like a spelling mistake, and it's pointing at the problem. And if I go over to where that problem is, on that, it's at this dollar sign. Uh, down at the bottom, behind the fan, it's saying, now let me just, I'll bring this up a bit. Uh, hang on, I'll just bring the fan. Probably quite hard for you to see this. It says expected next thing to be an escaping function. Um, again, it's because I'm using Vim that it's this kind of really weird-looking matrix-style view. But like, if you're using Sublime Text or something, it will it will tell you this in a more like neat way. Or, and like Sublime Text and uh, PHP, Storm. PHP Storm and all the other like, coder, they all have like really good ways of using PHP Code Sniffer. But yeah, fundamentally, it's going to tell me there's a problem there, and it'll tell me loads of other things. Like if I, for example, do Now let's say, now in the WordPress coding standards, we should have a space uh, whenever we're opening some parentheses after a function like this. So if I do, um, this doesn't even make any sense, but I think it will do this <laughs> if I do that. And hit save. It's going to have a new problem. Oh yeah, I didn't see PHP. <laughs> There you go. And that's actually quite handy as well. So it doesn't, it's not just WordPress coding standards, it'll also find just general problems. So it's saying, for anyone who can't see, it's noticed that there shouldn't be an opening angle bracket here because I'm already, I'm already in PHP. So if I get rid of that and save it again, what it's probably now going to say, oh, I'm actually, I'm just breaking the rules. It would normally, oh, no, it hasn't, it's not selling it. It would normally now say that I should have a space and it will say, by the way, you need to put a space between your brackets and yeah. We'll leave that, but it's really handy. I'd highly recommend using it, and uh, it's much easier to set up the next debug. Like everyone can do this today. It's really good, right? And my last thing, oops, sorry, is Beyond Compare. I have quite a nice demo with Beyond Compare. I was recently reviewing uh, a plugin, uh, the Bright Cave plugin, which is the video platform that some of you may be familiar with. Um, so we've been sent a diff, it was just an update to the Brightcove plugin for WordPress. Uh, we've been sent a diff and then actually the developer had realized they wanted to make a few more changes. So they sent me a new diff, which was almost exactly the same thing, but with a few minor changes. And that kind of thing is quite annoying because you're just like, oh, I've just reviewed the first one, which was like 10,000 lines. Now I've got to review the same thing again, but there's a couple of little things that have changed. How would I find those things? There are various ways of doing it, but Beyond Compare just makes it super easy. So if I click on open here, there we go. It's just found all the differences and there were hardly any. So all I needed to know was that at this part of the file, um, what you've got on the left is the new updated version. What you've got on the right is the old version. And so it's just like, ah, oh, here we go. So I just need to review that and tell him if that's okay or not, which is what I did. And it was great. Uh, and you can even see like the, the POT creation date thing here 
you probably can't see because it's too small. But it was like 7 o'clock over there, 7.25 over here. So I can see when he was working on it. Oh, and it was the 13th of April there, 15th of April here. You can literally see all the little changes he's made and then any, any little extra thing that he's added in, which is really good. So Beyond Compare is a really good tool. So, let's go back to my slides. A final thing I wanted to talk about, um, which is kind of a bit of an elephant in the room. Whoa. There we go. Um, I was talking about uncached functions and I was talking about how there are certain things WordPress does that are not particularly optimal for us if we're doing like, especially for a newspaper and we maybe want to be getting all sorts of weird and wonderful post combinations. We maybe want to be doing things that are sort of more akin to search or maybe even we want to have a search facility. I probably don't need to tell anyone here that the WordPress search functionality is pretty dreadful out of the box, like it just doesn't really work. It will just find, it doesn't rank anything by relevance, so if you type in like coffee, it will just find all of your posts that have coffee in, and then just give them back to you in like date order, which is just totally useless, because um, you want to know like something that's getting into more detail about coffee. Um, so a key thing that we use on WordPress.com and on WordPress.com VIP uh, is another piece of open source software, which is not too difficult to set up, but I'm going to set it as further reading because I was going to try and do a live demo of it and I started going through it this afternoon and I just thought this is just a bit messy. There are some really good tutorials that will explain to you how to do it. Um, the product is called Elasticsearch. It's open source, anyone can use it. It's absolutely brilliant. It will basically bring Google-like searching to WordPress um, and it's totally free, totally open source. You just need to configure it and set it up, which is not too difficult, especially if like, it does need its own server. So DigitalOcean, and there are other brands available, I'm sure, but DigitalOcean is one of my favorite things for testing this sort of thing. Um, DigitalOcean Digital allows you to set up like microservers. It's like Amazon do a very similar thing, and there are, I think Rackspace do one as well, uh, and there's loads of other competitors. But it's basically like these kind of microservers, DigitalOcean call them droplets, and the cheapest ones are $5 a month. And the reason that's relevant is because setting up Elasticsearch can initially, initially seem like a big pain. You've got to have another server, so you're like, oh man, to set up another server, that's going to cost me loads of money. But with something like DigitalOcean, it's five dollars a month, which is like what, three pounds in the UK. It's almost nothing, and you can actually have multiple things working on it. Uh, they have also an absolutely insanely amazing um, database of tutorials and of how-tos and documentation, and it just goes on and on. If you go to digitalocean.com/community and type in like anything in the search box, they will have how you set up this with this with this with this, and they string the whole thing together. So if you've never set up a server before, they tell you how to do that. Um, they tell you how to get like WordPress running, how to get Nginx going if you want to use that, how to install MySQL, like all the different parts of what power WordPress. Again, those things are more complicated than you even need because to set up Elasticsearch is actually really easy. There's this tutorial here, which is how to configure it, and then there's a plugin called Fantastic Elasticsearch for WordPress, uh, which basically allows you to link the two things together. Once you've got your Elasticsearch server, you connect it to Fantastic Elasticsearch, and then it will automatically replace all of your search boxes on your website with Elasticsearch searches. And they are, like the difference is, it's just night and day. Uh, it's so handy, yes. Once the search is indexed on your content, can you use that as kind of a replacement to your database? Exactly. And Fantastic Elasticsearch does quite a lot of that automatically. So it will actually automatically replace, I think it replaces WP Query with that, <laughs> with, with Elasticsearch. Because it's like, once it, once it has your indexes, it's like, right, we're fine, we're ready to go. Um, yeah, and then you can like, you can just go and go and go with that. And it obviously just gets, and that's what, that's what we've done. So. The funny thing about a lot of these things I was talking about is the way that we mostly mitigate these problems is using Elasticsearch, just because it's it's just better anyway. Like it's just so fast compared to using MySQL to index and stuff. Yes, yeah, that is quite similar actually. Yeah, it's. Uh, but I, I think there's more in the WordPress community. There's a lot more that's been done for Elasticsearch, so you'll find more tutorials. You'll find more. Uh, yeah, just more data. There's more plugins for it, for example. Uh, there are some others you can use. Ali Interactive, which are a big New York-based uh, agency. They like they've written the book on how to use Elasticsearch with WordPress basically, so they, they've, they actually built the plugin that we run on VIP. Um, the only reason I would recommend Fantastic Elasticsearch is that it's a bit easier to, to approach as a beginner. Uh, but the, the coolest thing as well about Fantastic Elasticsearch is if your Elasticsearch server is not working, it falls back to all the standard stuff. So it won't even like break, you can like, your, this Elasticsearch server could fall over that you set up and it just goes back to working how it normally would. Um, so it's really good. And for that sort of reason, it's good to still stick to all the best practice I was talking about because don't just chuck everything on Elasticsearch and forget about it. Like it's because you know, you, you might have problems. Um, 
but yeah, sorry if I've spoken too quickly. Uh, I'm around, and if you want to get in touch with me, uh, I'm at Jack Lennox on most things, on Twitter and other things. Um, it's jack at automatic.com if anyone wants to email me. I'll put my slides up, and I'll try and share as many of the other resources. Uh, I find with most of this kind of stuff, it's it's a lot to like you're all sitting here just like listening so you're not going to remember all this anyway uh but there's some like the main thing is like go to the vip.com documentation it's absolutely amazing uh and if anyone wants to work with us go to automatic.com slash work with us thank you <laughs> and any questions oh did we do questions or Continue. Yeah. does anyone have any questions is there something uh, interesting that you would like to share about the uh, actually I'm interested about the, uh, the VIP enterprise I know architecture. Is there anything interesting to share over there or because I, I'm 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 more familiar with the particular enterprise, I've yeah. seen PHP in small <coughs> scale but all of you so anything interesting in the last Um so I can talk a little bit about that. I'm I'm kind of I'm not the expert on that yeah, kind of thing. So, overall. but I can talk, yeah, in terms of overall data. So, so at the moment, obviously, we have WordPress.com, uh, which is the, the big platform. So that's what most of our VIP stuff is on. Um, we've actually very recently been working on a new platform for VIPs. I was talking to, um, I forgot your name, Spencer, so Spencer about this uh, earlier. And because uh, there are certain limitations that we've been hitting by having everything on this one massive uh, architecture. Uh, and certain clients want to do very bespoke things. We're also finding that I think we, we found we could actually get more performance benefits if we did start to break things off. So we've been working on a new platform which we call WordPress.com VIP Go. Um, and we're using Docker and we're creating these containerized uh, instances for our VIPs. So at the moment, it's only a handful of, of our VIP clients that are on it, but like Microsoft Studios is one of them. If you go to the Microsoft Studios website, it has a, even better response times than the ones I was saying at the start. So I know for that we're using, for anyone interested, uh, so it's a varnish layer. Uh, we've got what, load balancers, then varnish, and Nginx, and we're using like the reverse proxy thing with varnish to, yeah, to get like stuff from the Nginx. And beneath that, we have uh, two app servers, two MySQL servers, and we have that replicated among about 14 data centers around the world. So WordPress.com has, I, th I think it's 14 now, data centers. There's one in Singapore now. Um, and yeah, that's how Go is working. And I actually probably know a bit more about Go. For the whole, the rest, like in those same data centers, we then host the rest of WordPress.com. And um, the key things that you might find interesting about how we deal with that. Uh, we created, uh, a, there's a plugin called HyperDB, which uh, is for kind of sharding your database across, like one database across multiple databases, basically. So it's, um, and we, like Barry at Automatic, I think wrote most of that. And um, yeah, it's very interesting. If you want to know, like if you're wondering about high level scale problems, like HyperDB is a big thing. Uh, we also, uh, Donica at Automatic wrote a plugin called WP Supercache which is a really simple caching plugin, really, uh, which basically creates static HTML pages for like every page of a WordPress site. So, and we, we run that on WordPress.com. So for anyone who's not logged in, sorry? What was the name of that? It's called uh, WP Supercache. Yeah. Um, it's, on the, it's on the plugin repository. Uh, so that's, that's one of the caching plugins we use. Like the overall architecture, I don't know much technically about how we do it. I, I'm pretty, I know we use Nginx. Um, but I think it's pretty old school because it's one of these things that we've been like gradually, obviously it started in 2005. So it's kind of like we've had the same thing as Facebook where we've been trying to kind of backwards compatibility, like, sorry, no, what's the word? Like reverse engineer PHP to kind of make things about it better. And obviously PHP has been really catching up these days with like PHP 7. Uh, and PH the PHP project actually used WordPress as like their main benchmarking tool because it's, it's so popular. Um, but yeah, I know we've been, uh, before PHP 7, we've been using HHVM. Um, is that answering your questions, or is there anything more specific that you think I might do? Yeah, I'm, I'm not, uh, on that front, I'm not, I'm not the expert. The most crazy thing about it, which I find really mad, is that having told you all the figures and everything, our systems team is eight people, uh, and they are just located around all the time zones. So we have like people, that they're, they're, they're intentionally, we have like, I think, two in the States, um, a guy in Lithuania, I think, there's a guy in Sri Lanka. Uh, it just kind of like, and they and they all just cover each other. So we have this like constant thing. Um, 
and they are just absolute ninjas. Like I, I don't, uh, I don't know how. And I know that Barry is very well known in the world of, of scalability and systems because I think other comparable services to us have systems teams of hundreds of people. Um, but Barry is like the man for scalability, and, and as I was saying, for instead of throwing resources at things, working at how we can optimize things to make you know to, to stretch our systems further. Um, yeah, they're incredible, and they won't like they can't fly on a plane together because uh, you know <laughs> the inherent risk. So when we have like our grand meetup once a year where we all get together, they all have to stagger their flights, and it's uh, yeah, it's pretty crazy. But they're um, in fact, I think they have tr trouble even all being in one location because obviously they need to keep guard. But yeah, so. Um, uh, that's that's about as much as I know about how we work. I, I know more about VIP Go than I know about the current system because like it's it's just magic, and I think most people automatic don't worry about it because they're just like I don't know they did it. It's it's incredible, but we don't have to worry about it, which is nice. Um, any other? Oh, I don't know. Yeah, he, he I was speaking about it in a bit. Oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah. So thank thank you, Jack. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Thanks, John. Thank you, everyone.